So first of all, welcome everyone to this talk. Uh, my name's Pavla, and uh, a fair bit of warning before we start. Originally, this talk, the first iteration of this talk was uh, somewhere around three hours long. So I had to cut it a bit. And as a result, this talk will be probably the least technical one from this conference. So don't be afraid, nothing complex will be here. We'll be talking more about philosophy than, than engineering, probably. But anyway, I hope, I hope you enjoy it. So the name of this talk is Rocky Road to General AI. And uh, the main question here is, what is General AI and uh, whether we're on the road to it? I divided this talk into two parts. First, we talk about the philosophy of the question. And second, we will talk about some technical aspects of it. So the original problem. General AI is an elusive definition of a machine-driven artificial mind that is able to perceive world in a generic manner, taking first-hand human experience as a yardstick. This paradoxical notion leads to a paradoxical definition. General AI is, is usually seen as something that's always not there still. No matter how fast or how smart the machines we are building, a general perception is that the real AI is somewhere in the distant future, if ever reachable. Somewhere in between philosophy, cognitive neuroscience, and artificial intelligence, there exists a common open question. What is intelligence in the first place? While having von Neumann's definition for life, we struggle to get a grasp on the subject of consciousness as an independent notion. And as a, a result, it becomes highly speculative. There's something we know for sure, though. All the AI we have today is inherently computable in the church theory sense. That's it. Everything in machine we have today has a specific boundary of its ability to act on incoming signals. I want to highlight this so we don't have to go over it, over it again. Each and every artificial intelligence system we have today is as much as Turing complete, with its limits defined by the abilities of the underlying abstract machine. No analytical model, machine learning model, artificial neural network, or qubit-based quantum computer-based decision system is able to solve a task that the Turing machine, or any practical programming language for that matter, cannot. Hypercomputation is theorized, but might just be physically impossible. We don't have any implementation of a super Turing computing machines. But do these boundaries defy the possibility of general AI? For a commoner, any ML model is merely an approximation engine. Build a data set, train a model, fill in its weights with what's optimal in some sense doesn't really get more mechanical than this. And this definitely does not feel like a consciousness in any sense. Train a network to dif differentiate dogs from muffins, and it will do just that. And it will fail if the muffin is dog-like. But then humans do make mistakes as well. So can we judge the machines? Let's take a look at the certain boundaries of natural intelligence before going to the artificial one. Consider a hypothetical teleportation engine that sends things over the distance instantly. With all the traffic jams we have today, it seems like a cool business idea to employ uh, the, to make a daily routine more efficient. Now consider walking someone into this engine. The person appears on the other side of the portal and looks just the same as it was before going in. To lastly, consider two possibilities here. We either actually teleported the person or we have effectively killed it and have rebuilt a perfect clone on the way out with the same quantum state of mind. Can an observer, an external observer, notice any difference between these two events? Not at all. We don't have any possibility to dif differentiate between these two. 
However, for the person going in, it makes all the difference in the world. It's either a way to save on taxi or a fancy suicide booth. Having a perfect copy is not enough because something defines an individual. So let's bring up some definitions, shall we? Exoteric knowledge is the one that can be formalized and effectively delivered to another conscious person using any kind of communication medium. Esoteric knowledge, on the other hand, is the one that can only, only be perceived personally, cannot be formalized, and henceforth cannot be communicated. How would you tell someone who never smelled a banana how banana does smell like? It smells like banana, of course. It does not quantize further. We don't have words to describe a particular sensation that happens inside our brain when we do smell a banana. The color is esoteric as well. How do you describe color green to someone who's never seen color green? Despite the fact that color is based on a physical value, the frequency of an electromagnetic wave within the visible spectrum, it's still effectively a non-communicable notion. You can't describe what exactly you're seeing. You're only making, making communication based on the names for the, for the colors. And as you probably can see, or cannot see for that matter from this picture, different people have different interpretations for the, for the namings of the colors. They are more or less the same, but they are not exactly the same. We are not talking semantics, we are always talking some representation. But does it really make a difference if the person knows how the color green looks like? From perception point of view, the answer is still no. The actual qualia or the sensation of the color green is something that would remain black boxed. From communication point of view, the situation is strikingly different, however. Of course, we can talk about colors, and any two non-color blind individuals can easily discuss the subtle differences and the character of something that is green, or having any specific named color whatsoever. Well, as long as it's named. On this picture, you can see a classical example of a reversed visible spectra to visualize the idea. The perception is different, but the communicated notion might just be the same if both individuals label this perception as color green. If I, as an external observer, observer who sees these trees as green, can look through the eyes of these two persons on the semantic level of their qualia, I would see that for one of them, my perception would be quite the same. But for the other one, uh, I will discover that all the colors, colors are wrong, and my names for these colors are all wrong. Something that this person has previously, previously called green will look red to me, and I just won't find the correct, correct phrases to describe what am I seeing being inside this person's mind. But there is no problem if you don't see through the eyes of the other person. This is a fine line between the semantics and the communication protocol. And this fine line is finely described by uh, philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. Consider everyone holding a black box with a beetle label on it. One can see the beetle inside its own box, but cannot look inside other boxes. Is the communication about beetles possible in this regard? It certainly is. The common protocol level agreement is totally enough here. The differences in the semantics will be zeroed out by the representation. The boxes might just be empty. It won't doubt the discussion. How does this happen? Uh, you see, if we look inside the semantics level of a person that sees green as I would say red, and another person that sees green as I would say green, and a third person that sees green as I would say gray, but they still share the same communi communication protocol labels to, 
communicate about these things. Uh, the actual communication will commute. If the first person sees something that is light red and the cause is light green, the other person that would see this as light green would totally agree, yes, of course, this is exactly what I'm seeing as well. And the th third person, which will see this as light gray, but has it named, it, it named as light green, will say the same, that yes, of course, this is light green, this is what I perceive as, as light green. So, despite the differences in the, in the semantics, in the perception, how the person really sees the color, it uh, makes no difference in the, in the actual communication between them. More than that, if they ever wanted to check, is there any difference on a semantic level, uh, they will fail at that because there is no way it's, uh, it's possible to actually see. Group theorists might call this a morphism, and a category theorist will say that diagram in question commutes. And, well, it does. But you see, we don't care about the, 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 the semantics here. We don't care about the original perception of sensation or the qualia, and we can't care about that because we don't have any, any means to, to see inside other people's minds. But should we care in the first place? The world is objective and the amount of subjectiveness might not be an issue as long as it's a mere fraction of the shared knowledge. Of course, we have the, the smell of banana, we have, uh, I don't know, we have color green, but that's, uh, that's just a, a cherry-picked example, nothing more and uh, the vastness of our world seems to be very much objective. However, there's a catch. Let us make a small di digression here. Let us look at the numbers. We all know that rational numbers are infinite. It's really easy to perceive them as such, as we can actually visualize their multitude in a way to see the whole picture or at least a substantial part of it. You see that we uh, take the, the counter's way of looking at them or, or whatever else. We see their infinite one side, we see their infinite in, in the other direction. We can more or less draw them on the, on the infinite line or, or on the infinite plane and make this, uh, make this uh, visualization as dense as we want to. And as a result, we definitely feel them as infinite. We feel there are lot, lots of them. But what about the irrationals? Square root of 2 is irrational, as well as, as, well as pi and uh, the base for natural logarithm. These are cherry-picked examples as well. And the very amount of irrational seems to be rather subtle. If you are to consider or to talk about some examples of rational, rational numbers, how many would you be able to talk about? Five, ten, probably a hundred, if you try really, really hard. But the thing is, uh, we know for sure they are infinite. More than that, they're infinitely more infinite than the rationals. The difference is one of these, the rationals, we can easily visualize and we can easily see the, the infinity and the vastness of their amount. For the irrationals, it's not as simple. It might be just the same with the subjectivity of per perception. The colors we see, the sounds we hear, the feelings we feel, Virtually any notion that relates to the actual perception by the senses or to the inner state of mind is non-communicable, subjective and esoteric by nature. Even the perception of time, though we know for sure that the hour of time is same for all sentient beings, the speed of time is hidden and cannot be measured against. In the same way as with the colors, if we have one person with a fast perception of time and we have another person with a slow perception of time, 
For the person with a fast perception of time, the clock movement will be faster. And for the person with a slower perception of time, the clock movement will be slower. And so if they communicate with each other that uh, exactly 10 seconds have passed, they will totally agree on this. And they won't see the difference in their perception. In a certain sense, we can assume that this is exactly what makes us us. When you wake up in the morning, you're still the same person you were before going to sleep. Since the world is still being observed in the same way, and the translation from objective to subjective is still largely the same. Why am I talking about all these things? Why am I digging so much into philosophy of the question? After all, we're not on a philosophical concilium of some sort. We're on a technical conference. That's just because one common criticism of modern AI in general is that we can look into the underlying semantics of the model and discover two things. First, it is hardly comprehensible. You have your artificial neural network, you have uh, millions of billions on hi of hyperparameters. Uh, something is happening, the system is learning and the system is able to perform some tasks, but we can't really understand what is happening inside there. And the second thing is, it is uh, it's basically a number crunching engine, which seems not to be the case with us humans. However, both of, b both of these lead to, to us denying machines of cognizance. We don't know how they think, but they definitely don't do this the way we do. We do admit that they do think, however, after all, we only use machine learning in case we are unable to write down an analytical model ourselves. And this is pretty important because, uh, as we've seen previously, uh, machine learning does not lead us outside of this Turing completeness box. So anything that can be done with machine learning or with any artificial intelligence whatsoever can be programmed by a human using some normal standard programming language. Still, we use machine learning because in some cases we just don't know how to solve the issue. But talking about denying machines of cognizance, the reasons for that are well, basically the same as with other human beings. We kind of miss the point that it's kind of the same. Looking into other person, it is really hardly comprehensible how does the semantic look like. And it's uh, really difficult to understand whether thinking goes exactly in the same manner it goes in our own mind. Going from this philosophical standpoint into uh, some kind of te technicality, let us talk about what actually we can do to make our thinking machines better than they are today. If we're not concentrating on trying to make them think as humans do, because that really doesn't make a lot of sense. We don't understand how we think. We don't understand how other people think. Why should we understand how ma machines think? However, there are some objective qualities that we can change. Let's start talking about them. The first one that I want to bring here is uh, formalizing the qualia. AI of today is essentially esoteric by its nature. It does not deal with a formalized knowledge. Most of the artificial neural network systems of today start from a blank page, deducing the qualia from the signals they get. Imagine, imagine a person that's learning by example only, without the ability to read the books or surf the internet, or doing so, but without knowledge of a language underlying this data. This problem is two-way getting formalized information out of machine learning system and getting formalized information into the machine learning system. First one is currently analyzed in scope of neural Turing machines, LSTMs with a read-write memory matrix to work on. Second one is a matter of transfer learning, which is readily available for some machine learning systems such as Markov logic network and Bayesian networks, 
but wider application is yet to come. This is an example of how neural Turing machines work in general. Basically, it's an artificial neural network that uses the memory capability to store intermediate solutions as Turing machine programs. It's worth noting that uh, any artificial neural network system will look kinda, kinda like that because Every artificial neural network system, of course, runs on a computer, which is basically a Turing machine, which has memory and which works with this memory. So there is always a translation of the operations of the neural network into the operations of the Turing machine. However, the difference between ordinary artificial neural networks and uh, neural Turing machines is that neural Turing machine is aware of the Turing machine operations. It knows that it has this memory. It knows that it can store something into this memory and it can learn to use this memory to its avail. One of the white box properties that we want from the general AI is an ability to reflect on, on its own thoughts, analyzing how the task was completed. But we actually use machine learning for a lot of cases when we can't retrospect on ourselves. What is the vision and recognition algorithm in our own brain? Do you know how exactly do you recognize the things you see around you? How your attention is working? How do you classify things? Uh, how do you achieve the, the accuracy that you have for the... For the uh, recognition. We know the, the, the basic structure of a mind. We know the basic structure of the, of the visual cortex that we have in our brain. But can we actually lay it down as an algorithm, uh, a specific sequence of operations to, to achieve this goal? If you can, write it down and uh, most probably you will become an overnight billionaire because everyone wants machines to be able to perceive the world as we do. But I bet that you can't, you can't really retrospect on one of the crucial abilities, your own crucial abilities to react on the, on the outside world. Formalization of quality and getting from the semantics representation to the well-defined communication protocol level encapsulates the beetle and the box allowing for both formal training of the machine learning system and effective reuse of existing internal knowledge within the same ML system. And supervised model can under the hood be supervised by another system that was either supervised previously or was reinforcedly trained. As with humans, semantics is irrelevant the common agreement and notions that can give AI systems the same flexibility we use to communicate and share knowledge. We don't need to break out from the Chinese room, we actually need to get in. Second thing is thinking in analogies. AI of today is mostly one purpose, with the most crucial, crucial limitation due to inability to use analogies in thinking. Naturally, a general approximation engine, which is an artificial neural network, being fed the data fine-tuned to pick on certain KPIs for a certain task, will produce a model that's hardly generic. Transfer learning can lead to knowledge reuse being possible with a certain kind of representation learning. Recognition of uh, electromyographic signals is reapplied for recognition of electroencephalographic signals, thus allowing for modern prosthetics to operate. You see, we basically use the knowledge gathered in learning on one specific set of signals to be able to not to start from a blank page learning from the other set of signals or the other kind of signals. However, this is a special case with applied fields being very, very similar. Of course, that's a part of our brain that operates our muscles, and that's a part of peripheric neural system in our muscles themselves. In, in the more general case, the signals might not be as, as similar as they are in this 
in this one. For a more general context, analogy should be an achievable mapping between higher levels of abstraction in the model. The higher we get in the, in the abstraction level, the easier to us to actually abstract from the differences in the signals we're working with. Learning by example what a cat is. A child can adapt this knowledge to a broader topic by asking questions and getting dense answers. The tiger is a big cat with stripes. It takes knowing what cat size and stripes are to have a certain level of confidence with a tiger when seeing one. You don't have to look at the tens of thousands of pictures of tigers. One particular thing to notice here is Shannon's entropy of the incoming signal. The less information we know about the signal source, the sparser the packing of the information in the data. Random input is non-compressible, while certainty makes for really good encoding. You don't have to keep one bit for a toss if you know the coin is rigged. The actual full recognition pipeline, as with the cats and tigers, should only be triggered if the attention or analogy system has failed and we have to, back, uh, to go back to square one. Why is that? Because the density of the information will be drastically different. If we are to start from a blank page deducing ourselves what a tiger is, we need to get through a whole lot of information to build up our perception. And in case we can base on an analogy with a cat, something that we have already learned, the actual density of the information would be much, much higher. We only need some formal criteria to go from already learned, by example, information on what a cat is to the, to the tiger. The same goes with uh, operational density. Common artificial neural networks of today operate with billions of hyperparameters. Take a generative pre-trained transformer GPT implementation trend as an example. GPT-2 was at 1.5 billion hyperparameters. GPT-3 is already at 175 billion hyperparameters. And GPT-4 will probably be at, a, at 100 trillion parameters, um, but probably not as well. We don't know this for sure. This is uh, one of the... Uh, one of the uh, one one of the numbers that we have for that. Probably it will be smaller, but can be bigger as well. Training GPT-3 on one uh, NVIDIA Tesla V100 GPU will take approximately 355 years of time. Optimization of machine learning operations cannot be easily measured against a threshold. Kolmogorov complexity, which is used in the same matter as Shannon's entropy for the, for the information density, is not computable. So no Turing machine can actually be used to compute the Kolmogorov uh, complexity of the task at hand. You can't ask the computer how much effort will it take to perform certain tasks. However, there are ways to approximate operational needs for certain AI tasks, like complexity measure called persistent homology, which derives computational power needed from the topological properties of the incoming signal. How do we know that we are not there yet, that we still need to optimize on both informational and operational density? This is Aplesia, mollusk also known as sea hare. It's able to react on the signals from the environment in a pretty complex way. It's able to feed, to navigate, to reproduce, and to detect and respond to hazards such as predators, one of the traits of a general AI system. Its nervous system comprises of merely 20,000 neurons. Another thing to look at is uh, learning pipeline. Learning pipeline for modern AI systems mostly aim for finding the optimum of a single, albeit complex function with a brute force feeding of data. We spend a lot of time and money in pedagogical studies, yet when it comes to artificial intelligence, 
only the models receive the attention of the community, not the way we teach them effectively. Feral human children rarely develop verbal or social capabilities. Learning by example only and on one's own can only get you that far. It's basically a task of repeating all the social and cognitive evolution of mankind in scope of one life. Mission impossible, so to say. All our artificial intelligence is actually feral. What if we try to build a backlog for uh, some artificial intelligence system, a generic artificial intelligence system from, from a perspective that I have been following during this talk? If I look at this, I would say that probably the most interesting or the most crucial steps here would be Qualia formalization for the perception of the incoming signals. This is something that is currently being done with neural Turing machines, so we are already working on that. Qualia communication to avoid symbol grounding problem in intra-ML solutions. Transfer learning. Again, that's something that we are already wor working on. Both of these sum up to intra-ML and inter-ML knowledge transfer. So we know for sure that that is something that we understand we are lacking. And there are companies that are working on this. There are, uh, there are teams in universities around the world that are currently working on this. So we're definitely getting there. Thinking in analogies. GPT, uh, GPT-3, for example, already can think in analogies. It has some ways of doing so, specifically using zero-shot learning or zero-shot ta tasks transfer inside its structure. Probably not optimal enough, but at least we're already having some first steps in the right direction here. Model optimization, topological and homological analysis of the signals for constructive approximation of the Kolmogorov complexity underlying cognitive operations. We, know we, we need to know how much, how, how, how big should our artificial system be, how complex should it be for a task. We need to understand how complex the task is. We don't need to guess it. And the learning pipeline optimization, machine teaching, semi-automated data set annotation, or hybrid model ML systems with feeding the system formalized data, like the information on the geometry of the uh, outside world, so that machine does not have to deduce it from what it's seeing from the level of the, of the pixel buffers. Do we see any practical impossibilities implementing this backlog? We don't. We're actually progressing quite nicely with companies such as OpenAI and DeepMind at the forefront of pragmatic general AI implementation. But aren't we limited by the charge Turing thesis in the first place? Don't we see that no matter how good we are teaching the machines, they will never surpass the boundary of Turing completeness? It actually matters not. Any formal system is limited by the boundaries of its own. Consider Hofstadter's mill puzzle. A formal system with three letters and four rules of translation is not able to recognize whether a complex trans transition from an MI to MU state is possible because it requires reasoning beyond its axiomatic capabilities. Can we deduce the answer? Yes, we are computationally speaking more powerful than MU system. Still, we humans are not limitless as well. You might be familiar with continuum hypothesis, impossible algebraic structures like the field with one element order and famous Gödel's incompleteness theorems. Similar to the MU system, we are unable to see the boundaries of our cognition, but yet we bump at them from time to time, drawing the map of a labyrinth in a pitch black darkness. The actual question to ask is not whether AI will be able or have to surpass its Turing boundaries but whether these are strictly inside the boundaries of a bad neural network of a hypertrophied ganglion inside our own skulls. Turing test is about the inability to differentiate between human and machine communication. But the real test we might face may lie in our inability to recognize general AI 
or its possibilities, because these will most likely be inhuman. Alpha Zero was never taught by humans. It has an interest in open style of playing chess. This is uh, more or less the quote from, from Garry Kasparov, who played with Alpha Zero. Note the word style here. It's something that we quite rarely use to something that is not cognitive. We certainly know that these areas do intersect. They are not disjoint. There are tasks that both humans and machines can do alike. But what is the configuration? Does all the Turing completeness lie inside human consciousness? And there are no tasks that the computer can do, but we humans cannot. Or we have a certain area of intersection, but still we have some tasks that will be impossible for humans despite being possible for machines. We are yet to discover this. We don't know whether humans are super Turing, and we don't know how actually Turing completeness corresponds to the human consciousness. However, from the practical perspective, to get what we expect from the, from the cognizance of people, the ability to talk, to communicate, and uh, to solve the generic tasks, generic AI tasks, we probably don't have to have this circle of Turing completeness to be the same as the one for hum human consciousness. So what's the point of these musings today? To put it simple, don't look inside the box. The road to general AI is not a philosophical one, it's a technical one. It doesn't really matter whether we, the thinking individual is carbon or protein based or it's a cold machinery. What matters is an ability to communicate with a well-defined protocol agreed with all the parties involved. So what we need to have here is the ability to build this protocol and to communicate afterwards. And you know what? We're definitely getting there.